Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 388th episode, we have a bunch of news, including two new dinosaur discoveries. Yes. We've each got one. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Anchiornis, and our fun fact. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Taylor. And Taylor is a brand new patron, so thank you very much for joining. As well as Gabe, Arya and Tristanosaurus, Nicholas, Wyatt, the Gray Allosaurus, Elrex, Bruce, Joaquin, and Robert. Yes, thank you so much for being part of our dinosaur community. As a quick reminder, this is our last regular episode before we take parental leave. We do have one additional special episode, but this is the last one with the most recent dinosaur news. Yeah, next week is just our Q&A. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say just our Q&A because it also took a lot of research and has a lot of really interesting stuff in it. Yes, great questions. Thank you for everyone who sent them in. But yeah, just know we know we'll be a little bit behind on Dinosaur News for a little bit, but we will make sure to catch up. Oh, yeah. That's quite a promise. We're going to catch up. (laughs) Well, with all the biggest news anyway. Yeah. Later in the year. So, yes, that was just a quick broadcast. But anyway, (laughs) thank you again to everyone who is a part of our dinosaur community. We really appreciate you. And now jumping into the news, I'm going to kick it off with the new large theropod because Theropods are very exciting, so I get to talk about my new dinosaur before Sabrina. <laughs> this discovery was written by Alexis M. Aranciaga Rolando and others and published in Scientific Reports, which is open access. So if you want to see this new dinosaur in all of its glory, you can. Nice. It's a new Megaraptorid. And as a quick reminder, Megaraptorids are large carnivores, as you'd expect by the Mega, but they aren't particularly raptor-like, despite the raptor part of the name. The hand claw of the namesake Megaraptor was originally thought to be the toe sickle claw of a raptor, Mm -hmm. and it's about a foot long. So obviously, if you found that and thought it was a foot long (laughs) raptor claw, it would be from a very large raptor. Yes. But it turned out to just be an unusually curved hand claw. Still large. We've seen one up close. Yes, it is still very large, but it is not insanely large for a toe claw or for a hand claw even for that matter because it's only like a third the length of a therizinosaur claw for example and it's debated what megaraptorids are in terms of where they sit in the dinosaur family tree it's been suggested that megaraptorids are allosauroids tyrannosauroids or even spinosauroids they run the gamut yeah there's basically many of the major (laughs) dinosaur groups. We know they aren't carcharodontosaurids, but that's about as specific as we've gotten. These researchers think they're salurosaurs, which would put them closer to tyrannosauroids, although not quite in the tyrannosauroid group. And just for the record, dromaeosaurs are also salurosaurs, so that puts them in the same group as dromaeosaurs. Although from this research, they are much more distant relatives of dromaeosaurs than they are of tyrannosaurs. Then a couple examples of Megaraptorids. Megaraptor itself is about 8 meters or 26 feet long and weighed about a ton, which is about the size of a typical Allosaurus, although maybe a little bit more slender, and it obviously had a much more impressive first claw on its hand. Australovenator is another Megaraptorid that we've seen. It's a pretty cool one. It's a lot smaller, though. This new Megaraptorid is named Mipe, I think is how you pronounce it. It's spelled M-A-I-P. That's basically how you pronounce it in Spanish and English. So that's what I'm going to go with. And then the species name is Macrothorax. Mipe is, quote, an evil entity from the Anacoc mythology that represents the shadow of death, which kills with cold wind and roams in the Andes Mountains, end quote. Sounds menacing. Yeah, it's a pretty cool name for a a dinosaur. I like these really like local legends that make their way into dinosaur names. It's Mm -hmm. really cool. And the macrothorax is because it's got a bulky body, or as you could put it scientifically, a quote, wide thoracic cavity, end quote. (laughs) So it's menacing and also bulky. Yes, which makes it more menacing. They estimate it's a bulk of its thorax 
is over 1.2 meters or four feet wide. Wow. And just for scale, an average horse is apparently about two and a half feet, <laughs> which is just a little bit over half. Although Mipe might have been roughly the same as a Clydesdale horse. Ooh, those are large. Yes, and apparently they're very difficult to ride. I mean, you don't usually ride them. They're usually meant for pulling things and you sort of walk next to them or they pull a carriage or something because at four feet wide, it's very uncomfortable to get your legs spread that wide. Right. Clydesdale horse might probably wouldn't be an easy dinosaur to ride either. No, it is a carnivore. And in general, those are not very easy to domesticate. (laughs) But Clydesdale horses also weigh about a ton. So they're very large animals, just for your perspective. Mipe was found in Patagonia in the Chorillo Formation in southwestern Santa Cruz province in Argentina. It's from the early Maastrichtian, very roughly about 70 million years old. And Megaraptor is also from Patagonia, although in a different formation, which is actually about 15 to 20 million years earlier than Mipe. So Mipe was way later, one of the latest known Megaraptorids, if not the latest. They found a decent number of bones of Mipe. Unfortunately, none of the hands, arms, or skull which are some of the most exciting parts, especially the hands when you're talking about megaraptorids. But they did find several vertebrae from the back and tail. They found a vertebra from just behind the head, part of the shoulder, fragments of foot bones and hips, lots of partial ribs, and possibly most interesting, lots of gastralia. Hmm, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's a decent amount of sort of the body of the animal, although a lot of those bones are really fragmentary. Mm. So even though there's a part of a leg bone, it's just like a tiny piece of it, basically. Some of the bones were described by Novas et al. in 2019. So there are a couple that aren't brand new to science, but this description of most of the bones is. The dinosaur was named and sort of justified as a new genus based on several details. Mostly it's the shape of the coracoid in the shoulder. But there are also specific projections and air sac penetrations in the vertebrae, which look unique enough to make it its own genus. And there's a rib that has a quote-unquote honeycomb internal structure. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. The most interesting thing of Mipe is definitely its bulky body, which you could probably guess by the fact that they named the species Macrothorax. (laughs) It reminds me a bit of Sue, the drawings of it where the gastralia are shown closer to the ground than I'm used to seeing for theropods. So it doesn't have as high of a torso. It's basically like you've got the back and then the torso stretches down a lot closer to the ground. Like it's got more of a belly in a way, although it's not really a belly. It's more like a just barrel chested, big bulky animal. The gastralia being low is what gives it that big bulky body. And it's hard to imagine the gastralia being anywhere else since they have ribs that meet up with the gastralia and they seem to show the outline of the torso pretty clearly. They didn't put like a big gap in between the gastralia and the ribs like they actually do a little bit with Sue. Mm -hmm. In this case, the gastralia pretty much meet where the bottom of the ribs are. So it's you can't imagine it having a much smaller torso because it can't physically couldn't be. Yeah, exactly. Because the gastralia are, again, those they call them belly ribs. It's basically the structure that some reptiles and a lot of dinosaurs have where basically it's a separate set of ribs that sort of float below the main ribs that connect to the spine like the ones we have, but they are they just sort of float in the front on the bottom and they're connected by either tendons or ligaments or something like that. So I mentioned that its chest is over 1.2 meters or four feet wide. The reconstruction actually puts it at about 145 centimeters or four foot nine inches wide, hmm. which is just an extremely wide chest. It's even beefier vertically, though, and nearly two meters or about six feet tall. Person size. Yes, and that's not the height of the animal. That's just the bulk of the torso. (laughs) So in other words, lying down on the ground or a nest, I probably couldn't even see over it, which is crazy. I, I was trying to figure out how big an elephant was laying down. I couldn't figure it out very quickly, but I'm guessing it might be on that same sort of order of magnitude. It's just a very big animal. It wouldn't be as heavy as a modern mammal, for example, at that size, though, because they do have those air sacs and they have more respiratory system going on. So they're possibly not as heavy and dense in that area, but still just very large. 
for the record, their reconstruction puts it at about three meters or about 10 feet tall while it's standing. So that's actually only about another four feet in between its belly and the ground. And they only found a couple fragments from the legs. So that's a really rough estimate because the height off the ground is basically the legs that determines that. And we don't really have any of the legs. So that has to be based entirely on relatives. Lengthwise, they estimate might was about 9 to 10 meters or 30 to 33 feet long, making it potentially the largest megaraptorid ever found. The preprint title actually was, quote, the biggest megaraptoridae, but it got changed to a large megaraptoridae for it's, this paper. It's hard to know for sure. Yeah, it's especially hard to know because they, I think, got about 10 vertebrae in total, mostly from the neck and back and then a couple from the base of the tail. But with such an incomplete amount of vertebrae, it's really difficult to do. And one of the ways they wanted to do it was using something they call the rule of three, which is basically taking one segment of the vertebrae and then tripling it. But we don't even have that set of vertebrae completely. So it's very difficult to do. And since we don't have a really good complete skeleton of any megaraptorid, <laughs> it's even harder to do. But this is sort of based on the same types of estimates that we use for other dinosaurs, other megaraptorids. So if megaraptor is about eight meters long, then this one would be about nine or 10. There are these really interesting marks on lots of the ribs and vertebrae that look like attachments for costovertebral ligaments. Usually preservation isn't good enough to see those costovertebral ligament insertion points. And just for the record, costovertebral comes from costo, which is Latin for rib, and vertebral for vertebra. And so the ligaments just attach the ribs to the vertebrae. That's all that means. It's kind of a mouthful. Yeah, it's really hard to say. <laughs> More specifically, the costovertebral ligaments are used to hold up the ribs by the vertebrae because... If you think about sort of the structure of a dinosaur, especially a theropod, a bipedal animal like that, the vertebrae are held up by the legs and hips, and then the rest of the dinosaur sort of hangs off the vertebrae. <laughs> Basically how it works, like a teeter-totter. You've got the tail hanging off the back and the ribs and the skull hanging off the front, and it's sort of in a balance that way. But the vertebrae are that, like the wooden plank of the teeter-totter that everything else sits on. By looking at those ligament attachment points, it looks like there were two main areas where the ligaments wrap around the vertebrae and the ribs and where those places meet. One spot is on the butterfly wing looking projection that you see on the top of most vertebrae. And the other spot is below at the top of the round piece called the centrum. So it's got two different points where it connects, which is good because it weighs a lot. It's got a big old thorax. It needs mm -hmm. some good <laughs> ligament support. The attachments actually resemble tyrannosaurid attachments, and that's partly why I think their phylogenetic analysis put Megaraptora right next to Tyrannosauroidea. The author said, quote, In sum, our results support the hypothesis advocated by Lamana et al. that Megaraptorids became progressively bigger, much more abundant numerically, and taxonomically more diverse throughout the Cretaceous, end quote. This might mean that megaraptorids were taking advantage of the extinction of carcharodontosaurids, just like tyrannosaurids did in the northern hemisphere. But unlike the northern hemisphere, where tyrannosaurids really seemed to dominate the large predator niche, in the southern hemisphere, there were megaraptorids, abelosaurids, and possibly large unilagiids like Ostroraptor. So it was more diverse. Yes, at least there were more diverse large theropods taking over when carcharodontosaurids went away. Although, in the northern hemisphere, we do have Dakota raptor, which is sort of like an Unanlagiid. But I'm wondering if maybe these authors think that Dakota raptor might not be valid because there are whispers that Dakota raptor might get invalidated as a chimera. Oh, really? Yeah, there's, there's this potential that maybe Dakota Raptor is different types of dinosaurs stuck together into one individual. Oh, so that would be a bummer because Dakota Raptor is super cool. Yeah, but at least now we have Mipe, which is a even more cool dinosaur, frankly. 
True. Got the huge hand claws, presumably, and it's a lot bigger. And yeah, it's intense. There's another new dinosaur. This one's a new ornithomimosaur, though it doesn't yet have a name, that was found in the early information of Nei Mongol, North China. This was published in Cretaceous Research by Yao Shi and others. It is pre-proof, which means it's not yet finalized, but the paper has been peer-reviewed. And you want to cover it now because it's probably going to come out while we're gone. Yeah, and it's been peer-reviewed, so it's pretty close. Okay. So again, it's a new ornithomimosaur. They found a pelvis and a sacrum. The sacrum had five vertebrae with neural spines fused into a continuous plate. It doesn't yet have a name. It's known as Ornithomimosauria indeterminate because it's just too incomplete to name at this point. Now, according to the authors, the pelvic material is rarely, when you compare it to skull and limb bones, quote, been considered as a basis for referring specimens to Ornithomimosauria, end quote. But the fact that it had five rather than six sacral vertebrae made it unique from most other Ornithomimosaurs, so they felt comfortable. This ornithomimosaur lived in the late Cretaceous. Again, it was found in the early information in China, which was formerly the Irene Dabasu Formation. It got renamed in 1991 by the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources of Neymongol Autonomous Region. There's debate over the age of this formation. The authors of this paper said it's probably Campanian Maastrichtian age, so 83 to 66 million years ago, but that's based on the assumption that there were some animals in the formation, quote, with some relictual elements, end quote. So it's like a remnant or survivor community or species, and they lived in an environment that changed or was different from their typical environment in that formation during that time. And the author said, quote, for reasons that are presently unclear. (laughs) So if they weren't relict species, then it would make it older, presumably, because it wouldn't be this unique place where these older looking things survived. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty here and a lot of debate on this particular formation when it came to the age. There's been a lot of different papers on it. Now, other dinosaurs that were found in this formation include hadrosauroids, titanosaurs, salurosaurs, including tyrannosauroids, ornithomimids, oviraptors, therizinosauroids, and troodontids. So well, that's a lot. A lot of them, yeah. As well as isolated specimens referred to in chylosaurs and dromaeosaurs. Covering all the greatest hits from the Cretaceous. Yeah. There is also one other ornithomimid, Archaeoornithomimus asiaticus, which was originally thought to be ornithomimus, and then it got moved to Archaeoornithomimus in 1972 based on there were 27 fragmentary specimens from several localities found in that formation. Wow, that's a lot. It's a lot, but again, these are fragmentary specimens, so there's also some confusion here, which I'll get into Hmm. in a second. This new ornithomimosaur specimen is different enough from most archaeoornithomimus specimens. It's really difficult to compare the two, though, since the author said that they don't think all the fossils assigned to archaeoornithomimus are actually the same species, (laughs) because there's some differences in the features. But the pubis of this new ornithomimosaur is different from archaeoornithomimus. The shaft is straight rather than curved, and there's some other minor differences. The author says it's possible that this new specimen is the same species as some of the Archaeoornithomimus specimens, or it could be its own new species. Either way, they said there are two different ornithomimosaurs in the early end formation. We just don't know exactly how they're split up yet. The fossils of the new ornithomimosaur specimen were found in a 2002 expedition by Longhao Geologic and Paleontological Research Center of New Mongol, Hohot. The exact location wasn't documented, but it was from the early information. They said it's probably a subadult based on the size, but it's not yet fully grown because there's some sutures in the caudal vertebra that's still visible. But they just need more fossils to better clarify what it is and where it belongs. Interesting. So we're going to get a new dinosaur, a new ornithomimosaur from China, eventually, probably. If more fossils are found to clarify, yeah. Sounds like they might be if they've already found a couple dozen. Well, it's just a matter of sorting through them and figuring out which specimens belong to which species. And now we're going to take a quick sponsor break, but when we get back, we've got more news and then our dinosaur of the day. 
All right, moving on to other news. The University of Colorado Boulder is returning their Triceratops skull to the Smithsonian Institution. I didn't realize that they had it from the Smithsonian. I didn't either. It's apparently been on loan since 1981. When it returns, the scientists at the Smithsonian will be studying the skull. The skull is a holotype that was found during the Bone Wars by Marsh. Marsh did study it in 1891. It was found in Wyoming and named it the holotype of a new species, Triceratops calicornis, which has since been synonymized with Marsh's Triceratops horridus. So, yeah, holotype of this species that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so with something interesting other than just being another Triceratops horridus. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot to learn from it. Uh, visitors can still see it for free at the University of Colorado Boulder until May 8th. So there's so, still some time. If you're near the University of Colorado Boulder and you want to see it. Now's the time. You Yeah, get going. <laughs> <laughs> Next, the game Parkasaurus is now available on Nintendo Switch. And I bring it up because it looks like the cutest game ever. And I've been kind of waiting for it to be available on Switch to play. As a quick reminder, it's one of those, you, you build your own dinosaur park or attraction, and you also go on digs to find new dinosaurs, you build habitats to make them happy, make sure they have the right terrain, food, water, stuff like that, and then you also build your park, food for your guests, entertainment, hire staff, things like that. It launched for PC in 2018, but like I said, now it's on Switch. That's very cute, and I totally forgot that you can have hats for your dinosaurs. <laughs> That's obviously the most important thing. How do you like it so far? I know you just started playing it. It's a little bit complicated in the beginning, just because there's so many moving parts. There's a learning curve to it? A little bit, yeah, in terms of, okay, what is the most important thing? How do I grow it? How do I get enough money so I can keep finding these dinosaurs? But so far, it's been good. It reminded me a little bit of my favorite, one of my favorite games as a child, which was something like Dino Park Tycoon, I mm -hmm. think was the name of it. And basically, you went to the store and you would buy your dinosaur egg, and then you could put it in its little enclosure and choose the fence type and a couple other little details. And then you could also buy concession stands and things like that to make money off your park visitors and things. Mm-hmm. And I saw some of that in your game, but it looks way more in-depth than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's concession stands, there's you hire your employees and they build up experience and things that you can use to make your park even better, attract more visitors. And there's so many dinosaurs, I counted, it's almost 40 dinosaurs Oh wow! that you can get. Well, actually, I kind of scrolled through it really quick. It's probably more like almost 40 prehistoric animals because mm. in their, I think it's called like Dino Encyclopedia, it's in alphabetical order and it'll give you some information about the animal and at the bottom it'll tell you what time period it lived in. Mm -hmm. It's not all in the Mesozoic. Oh, I see. Did you have to, in order to get the dinosaurs, go on a dig and like find something about them or how do you recreate what's the story behind how they recreate the dinosaurs for the park well they do a tutorial in the beginning so i'm just a little past the tutorial and i got to choose between a stegosaurus and a triceratops egg to hatch and then they showed me how to there's a portal that you travel <laughs> into the past oh you go back in time you go back in time and you do digs and you have to find i think different pieces like a skull and some footprints and some other bones and once you did that you piece it together and you can make an egg out of it. So you go back in time, but you don't actually get a living dinosaur? You get pieces that you can put to make a living dinosaur eventually, yeah. Huh. I wonder if the portal doesn't just go to like some dig site in Montana or something? I don't know where it goes. It's not that. But it's all bones. Yeah. Well, <laughs> bones and footprints that I've come across so far, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. We have to give an update. In a few months. <laughs> see how far you get. <laughs> see how it goes. So far, I'm having fun. Good. It's a little bit addicting. I could see. And then, you know, in the videos, they show the dinosaurs wearing these cute hats. And then you can put up, like, lights to make it more festive and all kinds of stuff. It wouldn't be the first game you got addicted to. But on the bright side, I don't think it's freemium. I think you just buy it once and then you're done, right? I think so. I okay. haven't come across anything that said, give me your money. <laughs> they don't charge you extra for the hats. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Maybe if you want special hats, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> then we have a couple of updates around Jurassic World Dominion. I should mention that while we will be on parental leave, we are going to come back to do a review of the movie Dominion when it comes out. So Kind of have to. Yeah, kind of have to. Anyway. But these will be our last uh, updates and spoilers for a little while. <laughs> oh, that's true. So this is the spoiler alert. And rest assured that there won't be another spoiler alert until the movie comes out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even though there will probably be way more leaky type information in the time between oh, now I'm and then. Oh, I'm sure. There's stuff coming out almost every day right now. But anyway, so this first item is that Colin Trevorrow shared a map of Jurassic World Dominion that showed where the dinosaurs have ended up around the U.S. since Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. He tweeted it, so it's pretty easy to find. It shows where the dinosaurs are as well as the density, you know, where you can find more dinosaurs than other places. This is four years after Fallen Kingdom. Some of the dinosaurs were freed from Lockwood Estate. Some were auctioned off and taken around the world. In the U.S., most of them are in California and Northern California because that's where Lockwood Estate was, so that makes sense. There's also a lot on the borders of Oregon and Washington, the borders of Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, and the borders of Nevada and Utah. I'm surprised. I mean, the, the map is cool, and it is very much on the West Coast, so it does have that look of sort of spreading east, mm -hmm. but still very densely concentrated on the West Coast. But I didn't think it was supposed to be that long of a time period. So I'm going to, I already know what my fun fact is going to be for the Jurassic World Dominion episode. It's going to be about how long of time would need to pass and or just how fast would these dinosaurs have to reproduce in order to <laughs> establish themselves this much in the ecosystem? Because I didn't think that much time was supposed to pass, right? Because it's the same characters. They're returning the characters from the original movie. I think they're just keeping it in real time because Fallen Kingdom came out in 2018 and Dominion's coming out four years later. So you basically got four seasons of animals breeding, but they've now spread throughout most of the continent. That seems pretty extreme. <laughs> it was also unclear, you know, how many exactly made it off the island to begin with. Yeah, that's true. So that might explain a little bit of that. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, there's not really any dinosaurs on the East Coast. Looks like there's none in the South or the Midwest, none in Hawaii or Alaska. Again, this map is just of the U.S. It's cool, though. The map has a list of dinosaur names and names of other animals that are out in the wild. So we know which ones for sure are in the movie. And there's images on the map, so you know what types of animals are where. For example, the Mosasaur is in the Bering Sea. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Some additional dinosaurs and animals on the list include Velociraptor, T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Parasaurolophus, Apatosaurus, Ankylosaurus, Allosaurus, Baryonyx, Carnotaurus, Gallimimus, Compsognathus, Nasutoceratops, Stygimoloch, and Pteranodon. So none of those are new. Those are all ones that we've seen in other franchise films. <laughs> yeah, that list is actually missing some of the dinosaurs we've been hearing are going to appear in Dominion. Oh, yeah, like Pyroraptor. Mm-hmm, and the Giga. And Therizinosaurus. Yeah, maybe they're trying not to spoil the new dinosaurs with this map. Yeah, could be. Or maybe it's meant to be an incomplete map. Or we, we just don't know about these other dinosaurs yet. So the other, probably more spoilery thing that happened was that Jurassic World Dominion dropped a second trailer for the movie. Now in this trailer, which definitely has spoilers, Blue has a baby. No one seems to know exactly how that happened. Because <laughs> the last frog DNA. It's always the frog DNA. I guess. The last we saw of Blue was, I think she was running off in either California or Nevada. Must have been California. Everything was in California. Yeah. Wasn't Northern California, though. It was that same neighborhood, I think, where E.T. was. Oh, you're talking about like after the credits or something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember where that was. That might not have been in California then. So that's the last I remember hearing about Blue. So now Blue's got a baby. The baby gets kidnapped, and Owen Grady, Chris Pratt promises Blue he's going to save this baby raptor. <laughs> this is like John Wick, but with baby Blue. <laughs> yeah. 
and Blue must understand him. Colin Trevorrow said that for Dominion, he wanted other scientists in addition to Henry Wu to be able to clone the dinosaurs. And in the trailer, Wu says, quote, we made a terrible mistake. Ah, so that might explain why there are so many dinosaurs. Everybody's just cloning them like crazy. Yeah. And they're cranking out tons of these dinosaurs. And then I guess they everybody cuts them loose or they just escape multiple or something times. Something like that. Yeah. Just we underestimated the dinosaurs again. Hmm. It makes sense. They're kind of setting that up in Fallen Kingdom. That was why they were auctioning them off. Yeah. So in this world where the dinosaurs are running around loose, the non-avian dinosaurs, the idea is like you're not likely to come across them too often, but it is possible kind of the way we watch out for bears or sharks is what Trevorrow said. I say that with the caveat, unless you're the main characters in the movie, because it seems they're always coming across the dinosaurs. (laughs) Yeah. But they're probably actively searching for them, too. True. There are a lot of dinosaurs in the trailer, like the raptors that are chasing Owen in Italy. We knew about that one. I think we saw a clip a while back of it. Big spoilers, Pyroraptor can swim. It swims under a frozen lake. (laughs) That was so weird. It looked at the trailer like it intentionally jumps through the lake and starts trying to swim underneath them, Mm -hmm. which is the most crazy thing I've seen. (laughs) Maybe that's not what's happening. We'll have to see what it looks like in the movie. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's only for a second or two. There's also Ankylosaurus, Nasutoceratops. We see some sauropods wading through water as a fire rages around them, which that's sad. That reminds me of the Brachiosaurus scene in Fallen yeah. Kingdom. We also see Therizinosaurus. There's a pair of Carnotaurus attacking Owen Grady. And if I remember correctly, there was a pair of Carnotaurus in the novel The Lost World. Yep. And I know that they're trying to bring back elements of that novel into this movie. Got dodge then. Yeah. And then, of course, some other animals. You see Mosasaurus eating something in a cage. We're guessing crabs. Yeah, it was a big cage, so it could be a lot of things. But it looked like a fishing boat that was holding it. Yeah. And there's a pterosaur chasing after a plane. And then the trailer ends with the Giga, because that's going to be the big baddie of the movie. Yep. So there's a lot of cool dinosaurs to look out for when Dominion comes out. I can't wait. Me either. And real quick, we're going to jump into one more quick sponsor break. It's a little bit early, but we don't want to interrupt the dinosaur of the day. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Ankyornis. Hold on to your butts. This is a long one. (laughs) (laughs) I bring it up now because it's kind of mentioned in Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. Darius mentions Ankyornis as a possible new dinosaur in Jurassic World. And that was announced while he was visiting his father in a hospital. So somewhat in the canon. Ankyornis was a pear avian dinosaur that lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Liaoning, China, in the Tiaojishan Formation. It looks a lot like a bird, but with feathers on its legs. It also has teeth. And it's often depicted as having a lot of feathers on its head, almost like a crest. It's somewhat similar to modern birds. It's one of the closest relatives of Aves. Anchiornis was about 5 to 10 million years older than Archaeopteryx. It was small with the four wings because it's got the feathers on the legs, so that's why we consider it four wings. It was about the size of a crow or a pigeon. Originally, it was estimated to be 13 inches or 34 centimeters long. Yeah, that's a pretty big crow. Yeah. yeah crows can get pretty big. <laughs> The holotype was estimated to be 34 centimeters long, and according to the original paper on it, quote, reinforces the deduction that small size evolved early in the history of birds, end quote. Some specimens were larger, so they could get up to like 16 inches or 40 centimeters long and weigh 0.55 pounds or 0.25 kilograms. Overall, it was estimated to weigh about 0.24 pounds or 110 grams. Anchiornis was bipedal with a triangular skull, It had small, unserrated teeth, a slender, short scapula, long arms, long legs, and a long, bony tail. Its forelimbs were about 80% the length of its hind limbs. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that doesn't seem particularly bird-like. Its hind limbs are still longer than its arms. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It had an elongate hind limb, so long legs, but it may not have been a strong runner because runners tend not to have a lot of hair or feathers on the legs. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
It had four toes on each foot, and the third and fourth toes were the longest ones. The first toe, the hallux, was not reversed the way it is in animals that perch, so it probably didn't perch. And skin and muscle tissues of Anchiornis have been found. The type and only species is Anchiornis huxleyi. It was described by Xu Xing and others in 2009. The genus name Anchiornis means near bird, and the species name refers to Thomas Huxley, quote, who pioneered research into avian origins, end quote. Yeah, he was awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was one of the first to suggest a connection between birds and dinosaurs. And everyone thought he was crazy. I'm sure not everyone. (laughs) Yeah, he got along with Darwin, but a lot of other people. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the type specimen for Anchiornis is articulated. It is, however, missing the skull, part of the tail, and right forelimb. But the holotype includes cervical vertebrae, posterior caudal vertebrae, and, quote, faint feather impressions preserved on the slab and counter slab. Oh, yeah. Those feather impressions. Yes. Those are big news. <laughs> and the holotype is probably a subadult or a young adult because of, quote, complete fusion of all the post-cervical vertebral neurocentral sutures, end quote. Things were fused, so they're thinking young adult. There are no lags. There was a second specimen found that was larger and more complete, with long wing feathers on the hands, arms, legs, and feet. Now, hundreds of specimens have been found, so we know a lot about (laughs) Anchiornis. Yeah. Yeah, some of these localities in China, especially these birds, these early dinosaur bird hybrid situations, they find so many of them. Mm -hmm. So you get really good sample size, and you can learn a lot about the animal. Just to give you an idea, the Shandong Tianyu Museum of Nature in Pinyin County, China, reportedly has 255 Anchiornis specimens in their collections as of 2010. Oh, man, that is a lot. And that was 12 years ago. Yeah. So Anchiornis was covered in feathers. There were some scales. It had these long, narrow, veined feathers on the wings, legs, and tail. And it had two types of downy feathers on the rest of its body. It also had long feathers on its head that may have formed a crest. Its wingspan was up to 20 inches or 50 centimeters. The wing had 11 primary feathers and 10 secondary feathers, and they formed this rounded wing. The wing feathers were symmetrical, so that wasn't so great for flying. The longest wing feathers were near the wrist, so the wing was broadest in the middle, and then it tapered near the tip that made it look more rounded. It had a flap of skin that connected the wrist to the shoulder that was covered in feathers that covered the gaps between those primary and secondary feathers. Now, unlike modern birds, the feathers were not arranged in tracks or rows. There was also covert feathers that covered most of the wing's surface, and it had the long veined feathers on the hind legs. Oh, they had veins on the hind legs too. That does make them seem pretty wing-like. Mm-hmm. And these hind wings had 12 to 13 flight feathers on the lower leg and 10 to 11 on the upper foot. And the hind wing feathers were the longest, closest to the body. So it did look like a four-winged dinosaur, similar to Microraptor. The feet, other than the claws, were also covered in feathers. It was a very feathery dinosaur. And the foot feathers were short and pointed downward. In 2010, there was a study that looked at melanosomes in Anchiornis feathers and compared them to modern birds. And the authors figured out almost all of the color of Anchiornis, except the tail, which was missing. Yeah, that was the first time I think I read about melanosomes. I read that paper not too long after it came out, and I was amazed. <laughs> oh, yeah? You read it in 2010? No, it was a couple years later. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it was cool how much information there was. Now, the first dinosaur where we knew its color was Cynosauropteryx that had a banded orange and white tail. But I think we know more about the colors of Anchiornis. There's two types of melanosomes, eumelanosomes, which are black-gray shades. They tend to be long and sausage-shaped. And fail melanosomes, which are reddish to yellowish in color. They tend to be rounder and jelly bean-shaped. So knowing these types of melanosomes helps to figure out the colors in dinosaurs. And the study showed that Anchiornis had a feathered crest on its head. Most of its body was gray and black. The crown feathers on the head were reddish brown with a gray base. And the face had reddish brown speckles among mostly black feathers. 
The wing feathers were white with black tips, and the covert feathers were gray. There were larger covert feathers on the wing that were also white with gray or black tips to form rows of darker dots on the mid-wing. So it looked like stripes of even rows of dots on the outer wing and uneven speckles on the inner wing. I should mention the white and gray are a little bit more speculative than the brown and black because, like you said, the melanosomes, you can see the black coloration or at least presumably black coloration if the melanin matches with the melanosomes in the way we think it does for those rounder and (laughs) sausage-shaped melanosomes. But for the white and the gray, it's usually more of an assumption like, oh, it's got you melanin, but there's less of it. So then maybe it's gray or we don't see anything. So therefore it's white. But that's a little bit harder to determine for sure. It's pretty cool, though. If you were to search for images of Ankyornis, you would see all the paleo art looks the same, the coloring. And you yeah. never see that with like any other dinosaur. That's true. So the legs were mostly gray and the feet and toes were black. In 2015, there was a study of a different Ankyornis specimen that found only gray-black melanosomes without any reddish color in the crown. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's possible that the melanosomes were preserved differently, or maybe there were different investigative techniques used, or the first specimen was smaller, and it could be that the reddish-brown color got replaced as Ankyornis grew bigger, or grew older. Or it could be due to some regional differences, or... Maybe there's even different species of Ankyornis. Yeah. Yeah. That's anywhere from it's the same animal and we detected it differently all the way to it's a totally different species. Yeah. <laughs> and anywhere in between. Yes. <laughs> in 2010, Twango Lee and others looked at the melanosomes of Ankyornis feathers and suggested the feathers were for finding mates or for other communication, like defense postures or for startling predators or sending warning signals. Hmm. In 2015, Johan Lindgren and others looked at the molecular structure of feathers in an Ankyornis specimen and found, quote, unequivocally that melanosomes can be preserved in fossil feathers, end quote, because there's some debate before about them being indistinguishable from microbes and skin tissue that colonize during decay. In 2012, Nicholas Longridge and others analyzed wing feather arrangement in Archaeopteryx and Ankyornis, and they found that they had multiple rows of feathers. Is found that enantiornithines had modern wings, and the oldest one, Prototeryx, was from 131 million years ago. That's about 25 million years after Ankyornis, so it may mean that the wing feather arrangement in modern birds evolved over tens of millions of years and then stayed mostly the same for more than 130 million years. <laughs> Ever since. Yeah. The feather arrangement packed together layers of relatively weak feathers which may have made them strong enough to work like airfoils. They produce lift and drag when they're moved through the air, which would have been thicker than those in modern birds, increasing drag at low speeds and decreasing drag at higher speeds. The overlapping feathers would have made it really difficult for Ankyornis to take off from the ground. In 2017, Evan Seda and others found Ankyornis to have a, quote, shaggy, open-veined, bifurcated feather with long, flexible barbs attached to a short rachis, end quote. This is probably used for thermal regulation and repelling water, and combined with the open vein wing feathers, quote, would have decreased aerodynamic efficiency. But Ankyornis did look fluffy. It's good to know. <laughs> In 2019, Yan Hong Pan and others analyzed Ankyornis feathers and found alpha keratins, which are usually only found in modern feathers, and beta keratins, which were modified in a way that made the feathers more flexible. They analyzed the feathers from Ankyornis and compared them to other fossil feathers and modern flight feathers from like chickens, geese, ducks, emus. And they found that modern birds had mostly beta keratins in mature feathers, whereas Ankyornis had beta keratins and alpha keratins in its feathers. So this further showed that feathers may have at first evolved for reasons other than flight. And this means that this modification happened earlier than we previously thought. Flight feathers were thought to evolve about 145 million years ago, and Ankyornis lived about 160 million years ago, so Ankyornis feathers help show how feathers evolve for flight. Maybe. Maybe. (laughs) Originally, Ankyornis was thought could fly or glide, but later it was found that 
the wings were too short. In 2016, a study found that juvenile Anguirus may have been able to use its wings to help run up hills, and maybe it could fly while flapping if it was using a high-angle flapping wing stroke, but then adults would have been too heavy to fly. If it was flapping while running, it would have sped it up by about 10%. And if it was flapping while leaping, that would increase the height and distance by around 15-20%. to That's not nothing, but it's also not particularly impressive. Yeah. In 2009... Shuxing and others, when they described Anchiornis, they wrote, quote, some wrist features indicative of high mobility, presaging the wing folding mechanism seen in more derived birds and suggesting rapid evolution of the carpus. And they said that Anchiornis, quote, represents a transitional step toward the avian condition. So it had a more avian-like wrist than other non-avian theropods. And the avian wrist, for birds, they're modified for wing folding and flying. In 2014, Xiao Ting Zheng and others analyzed 226 Anchiornis specimens because why not? We have that many available. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't quite use all of them because you had 255 as of 2010 in one museum. Yeah, I guess so. They also analyzed 96 Sapiornis specimens and they found no sternum in either Anchiornis or Sapiornis. Oh, that's a problem if you're trying to fly. Yes. So neither Anchiornis nor Sapiornis may have had a sternum, which, quote, could represent the plesiomorphic avian condition, end quote. The ossified sternum is sometimes missing in fossil birds, but not having a sternum, quote, suggests that flight capabilities would be severely limited in basal birds. So sternums are important for flight. They found that in Anchiornis and Sapiornis, the absence of these sternal elements are, quote, a true feature of these taxa and not an artifact of preservation or ontogeny. Yeah, if you've got over 200 to work from and you can't find it in a single one of them. Then it seems <laughs> like you can rule it out. <laughs> Sometimes absence of evidence is evidence of absence. <laughs> yes, and they did histology on the specimens too. They found them all to be mature. Hmm. It's possible that Gastralia may have supported the muscles needed for gliding if they glided, but that's not clear. There was a 2010 study by Alexander and others that did find Anchiornis to be a glider. In 2014, Garnet Fraser suggested the long legs of Anchiornis could be related to, quote, dorsal riding parasitic behavior, end quote. It was riding on the backs of other animals and used for, quote, running, jumping, and climbing over plates and spikes. The need for a gliding dismount would explain long feathers on these long legs. That is quite a hypothesis. That would be so fun to see if <laughs> that was true. It evolved long legs for hopping around <laughs> plates on animals. Yeah. And then would glide off. And the <laughs> glide off to dismount gracefully. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe. Maybe it did that. That's really fun to think about. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Anchiornis had large claws on the third digit of its foot, in addition to its sickle-shaped second claws. The foot pads were covered in small pebble-like scales, and it had scales on the top of the feet. Some Anchiornis specimens had scales on the toes, tarsus, and lower leg, so maybe there were some scales beneath the feathers. Anchiornis had three clawed fingers, where the longest two fingers were stuck together with skin and tissue from the wing, so... Basically, it only had two fingers. The skin around the bottom of the fingers and the toes were covered in tiny rounded scales. In 2018, Xiao Ting Zheng and others studied six gastric pellets that were attributed to Anchiornis, which had been, quote, lightly acid etched lizard bones or fish scales. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. A little bit of gut contents for you. A little bit. You know how much I love gut contents. This made Anchiornis the earliest, most basal-known theropod known to produce gastric pellets. And it's the only definitively known gastric pellets from any non-avialin theropod. And these pellets were similar to those of modern birds. And just as a quick aside, pellets are undigested food parts that are regurgitated. Yeah, because they can't be swallowed or they don't want to swallow them. Mm -hmm. All the way down, at least. I guess they're swallowed part way they're in the stomach but they don't get all the way into the intestines for digesting yeah now this helps show a digestive system similar to modern birds quote and that the evolution of modern avian digestion may have been related to the appearance 
of aerial locomotion in this lineage, end quote. And birds, probably not a big surprise, they have a high metabolism. Anchiornis had a two-chambered stomach, efficient antiperistalsis that propelled food from the stomach back up to the mouth, low stomach acidity, and short gastric residence, which may mean that this really specialized digestive system, which is also seen in birds, was ancestral in paraves or even Manoraptora. The regurgitating would have improved paraves digestion, like how efficient it is, which may have helped give it energy for aerial locomotion, and then early paravians could also have quickly gotten rid of any non-digested food to make themselves lighter quickly. Now, Anchiornis was probably an opportunistic generalist hunter, as were many dinosaurs. Three lizard skeletons were found in one pellet, or the presence of them were found in one pellet. Wow. Fish may have been a big part of its diet, based on five of the six pellets containing only fish scales. Oh, wow. Yeah. So maybe its longer legs have more to do with waiting or something than dancing around stegosaur plates? Maybe. I mean, Anchiornis, though, didn't seem great for catching fish, because compared to birds that live near water, it had a lot of feathers below the knee. Oh, yeah. And it had a relatively short snout, and usually birds that catch fish have long, slender bills. Oh, yeah, that is super weird. Usually you don't want a bunch of feathers in the water when you're yeah. trying to walk around. Now, the fish found could mean that Anchiornis could catch some fish, or maybe there's a preservation bias for these fish-bearing pellets, and we don't actually know the true diet of Anchiornis. It's just this one particular set of pellets. Anchiornis lived in a subtropical to temperate climate. It was warm and humid. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include other bird-like dinosaurs, like Aurornis, Saracornis, and Xiaotingia, and the heterodontosaur Tianyulong. And other animals that lived around the same time and place included pterosaurs, salamanders, insects, arachnids, and mammals. Now onto our fun fact, and I covered this one because I had more to say about Anchiornis. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many cool papers about this dinosaur. Now, gastric pellets are regurgitated in digestible food bits. Aside from Anchiornis, very few gastric pellets have been found with non-avian dinosaurs. But some pellets have been attributed to Troodon. We talked about this in episode 310. It was one of the talks from SVP, and the paper about it came out in July of 2021. Basically, there were regurgitolites with pieces of mammal in them found at Egg Mountain in Montana that included parts of skulls, parts of the pelvis, parts of the jaw of a rodent-like mammal, and marsupial forms. These regurgitolites had features similar to raptors in terms of breakage and digestion, so the researchers think it most likely came from Troodon because Troodon had shed teeth at the same area, and there was also evidence of nests from Troodon. Now, Tom Holtz tweeted fairly recently that, quote, fossilized remains of the digestive system products, like poop, gut contents, vomit, are called bromelites, end quote, and these can be very hard to identify. We've got a link where Tom Holt shared a really great flowchart of questions to ask, if anyone's curious. Step one is, is it a bromelite? And then there's different questions. It's a flowchart. What to look <laughs> for, yes or no. And step two is, what kind of bromelite is it? I think it basically comes down to, is it a coprolite or a regurgitolite? Or is it too ambiguous to know? And some of those questions include, you know, is there etching on the bones or... If it's highly digestible, soft tissues, are, are they also there? A lot of interesting things that hadn't considered, but also we don't talk too much about bromelites. Nope, they're not super common. Coprolite is definitely more common than regurgitolites, but it's cool to see. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you're finding soft tissues, that's probably more likely to be a regurgitolite because it hasn't been as fully digested. Yes, and if there's no soft tissues, it's probably a coprolite. Cool. So we'll have a link. You can check out the flowchart for yourself and ask yourself these questions if you ever come across <laughs> this sort of fossil. Something that looks like it might have been inside a dinosaur at some point. Yep. 
And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you again for listening. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, this is our last regular episode for a while while we're on parental leave. And by regular, I mean where we're covering the latest dinosaur news. Mm -hmm. But don't worry, we have pre-recorded a bunch of episodes with lots of interviews and a lot of great deep dives into topics that we've been interested in for a while and that we've heard that you, our listeners, have been interested in. So there will still be new episodes coming out every week. Tons of interviews, too. Oh, yes. And if you want links to more information about our interviewees or even past episodes and all of our sources, then be sure to go to our website, inodino.com. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.